Shalom Chavrim, and it is always a pleasure to get to come and speak with you guys. Uh, we need to continue to pray for the three young men that were kidnapped over in Israel uh, for their safe return, as I'm sure many of you have. And uh, there's a lot going on with this uh, situation in Baghdad with this group called ISIS. And I do know that the, the, the name Isis is uh, of a Babylonian god. And, but there are some that really believe that what is taking place in Baghdad right now is the Babylonian Empire being restored. And it is very contrary to Scripture as far as that goes. Now, to say that the Muslim people do not have a major role in what's happening into the end of days would be, well, it'd be kind of absurd on my part not to know that this is true. There is a major role that they play, uh, <clears throat> and it's definitely not over by far. But uh, sometimes we kind of get the scriptures mixed up, and I think many ministers they don't they don't mean to, but uh, but there is an agenda that is going on, and the agenda is to get the eyes off the Vatican so that people will think that really and truly something else is going on, that, it, that it's really not the Vatican. This, this is why the Vatican created the, the Muslim religion in the first place, why they had Kaji, who was a faithful uh, Catholic girl of, of her era, uh, who they had married Muhammad, and because they, they saw in Muhammad that he would be a leader, and they felt that this would be the man that they could create a religion with. And they did that in, with monks in northern uh, Africa at that time and uh, were very successful in doing so. In fact, later Kanji writes that her husband became very demonic uh, with his visions that he was having. Uh, by the way, uh, Muhammad could not read or write, uh, so the, his, what his words were were dictated and later put into print. Um, at any rate, though, I've kind of gone over that with you quite a bit in different areas, and I want to go right into this because <clears throat> the scriptures that, uh, that are written in the book of um, uh, Jeremiah, chapter 50, uh, and chapter 51, mainly chapter 50, is, <clears throat> has been quoted uh, by some and by friends of mine as well, as being a fulfillment of the events that are taking place uh, with this group called ISIS, and that uh, that we would soon see um, the Babylonian. I get. I'm assuming now. I don't. I'm not. I don't. I'm not interested in calling in calling names. But I, from what it appears to me, a lot of people are thinking that this is going to be the restoration of the Babylonian Empire. But I took and I actually printed out um, these verses on some paper here, so I could inject the scriptures that, that go with this so that it might better help you to understand what's happening here. And I wanted to kind of read this step by step with you. Um, so I just copied and pasted from the memory uh, Hebrew Bible, the, the, the portions of the Tanakh, uh, and I included both uh, the Christian writings from the book of Revelation, the book of Daniel, uh, several other places are, are in here. So let's take, let's begin in Jeremiah chapter 17 is where I'd like to begin at. It said, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. And last, this king, uh, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones. Now, this is one of the reasons why I think people tend to look at the Babylonian kingdom of during the time of Persia when uh, Nebuchadnezzar, excuse me, Nebuchadnezzar was king, that it's a resurrection of this kingdom. But let's follow the scripture carefully, very slowly, methodically, so that you'll really get a grasp of understanding what's going on. There's key verses that are written here that help you to understand that. Now, interestingly enough, we see the first, the king of Assyria hath devoured him. That's the house of Israel. House of Israel went into exile. They have never returned since then. Okay, uh, Nebuchadnezzar caused uh, Israel to go into exile for 70 years. That was a prophecy by Jeremiah as well. And they would come out. They came out. They returned. They went back into exile in 70 A.D. 
or the CE, the common area, after uh, Amenodominin, the, the way it's written, Gregorian, and they have also went into exile for 2,000 years, uh, nearly 2,000 years, and in 1948, Israel became a nation again, and of course we did have Jewish people coming back to the homeland before that, but in 1948, when Israel became a nation, um, that was the first time after 1,948 years, or well less than that, that, that Israel had been in exile, longest exile of the Jewish people ever, not counting the House of Israel, because many of the, uh, the, the remnant of the House of Israel is still in exile. So let's go on a little further. Verse 18, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, our Hashem of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will punish the king of Babylon and his land as I have punished the king of Assyria. Now, by the way, Assyria is going to become a ruinous heap. So the judgment of God on Assyria still has not been fulfilled as of yet. Keep that in mind. And I will bring back Israel to his pasture. Now, I want you to think about this now, because when we first start off in verse 17, he speaks about the king of Assyria, which was 723 BCE, a 10-year campaign that took the, the northern 10 tribes, and they went into exile as a result of this 10-year-long battle. And then we come down a little further in verse 17, and we find that um, at last this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, hath broken his bones, talking about the house of Judah. But we know that was only a 70-year uh, prophecy. In fact, we, Jeremiah, Daniel says clearly by the reading of books, he knew that they were only to be in exile for a generation, for 70 years. So let's watch what the scripture says here. Verse 19, I will bring Israel back to his pasture and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan and his soul shall be satisfied upon the hills of Ephraim and in Gilead. In those days... In that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant. Now, verse 20 here clearly sets a stage that was not fulfilled back in the times when Yeshua was here. Because notice what he says. I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant. But he also says, In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. So the house of Israel and the house of Judah are totally pardoned at that time. That's, that establishes a time period. Well, let's look in the Word of God and see when does this actually happen. There is, a, there is a scripture that clearly tells us when Israel's iniquities and sins will be wiped out. That's found in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 24. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sin and to, for, uh, to forgive iniquity. And notice, it's 70 weeks, just like Israel was in captivity for 70 years. You see, now we understand why there's a parallel here. Because just as it was 70 years that Israel was in captivity because of the Babylonian exile through King Nebuchadnezzar, now we have a 70 weeks period. But in this case here, it's going to span a much longer time than what we would think. It's not just 70 weeks or those could be interpreted as years because it's actually the way it does work out. Each, each um, day represents a year and we're able to tell that by the exile and the times that things that happen with Israel from the time that Nehemiah, for example, uh, brings forth the decree that they're to rebuild the walls and the cities and the moats in Jerusalem not the temple. See, King Cyrus and King Darius actually bring about for the rebuilding of the temple. But it was King, the, uh, but it was during Nehemiah the prophet under the king of Artaxerxes that Israel actually goes and restores the walls and the cities according to the prophecy of Daniel. 
until the time when an anointed prince shall be X number of weeks. And when we find that out, according to translation in years, that meaning each day representing a year, it was exactly, and I believe that's 490 years, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'm just, I'm not reading it right now, so please forgive me if I didn't get that right. Understand, I'm just trying to go by memory on that. Uh, so, because I know you guys are good about making sure I don't make any mistakes. So anyway, but the point made, made here, notice what he says. Seventy weeks are decreed upon thy people, upon thy holy city, to finish the transgression. So see, Daniel's people are the children of Israel. The holy city is Jerusalem. And to make an end of sin and to forgive iniquity. All right. Well, notice what it says here in verse 20 of uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. See, uh, in those days and at that time, said the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none in the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. Well, Daniel says that during this 70th week period, it was to make an end of sin and to for, and forgive iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal the vision and the prophet and to anoint the most holy place. That's according to Daniel 9.24. Well, Israel's sins and iniquities will be no more when what? When they recognize Yeshua to be Mashiach. And this is what happens in the final Seven years are the last week of Daniel's 70th week. Now, so let's move on a little bit. Let's go to verse 21 of Jeremiah chapter 50. Go up against the land of Marathon, even against it, and against the inhabitants of Pekod, waste and utterly destroy after them, saith the Lord. And do according to all that I have commanded thee. Hark, battle is in the land, great destruction. How is the hammer of the whole earth cut asunder and broken? How is Babylon become a desolation among the nations? Isn't that interesting? They become a desolation among the nations. Hmm. I have laid a snare for thee, and thou art also taken. O Babylon, thou wast not aware. Thou art found and also caught, because thou hast striven against the Lord. The Lord hath opened his army and hath brought forth the weapons of his indignation, for it is the work that the Lord of God of hosts hath to do in the land of the Chaldeans. Come against her from every quarter, open her granaries, cast her up as heaps, and destroy her utterly. Let nothing of her be left. Like the Pharaoh of Egypt, see, she's stored up. She stored up food, but not for Israel's sake. Now, when I say they've stored up, I'm talking about the Vatican. Because according to Revelation, it's Mystery Babylon. Mystery Babylon, then, no doubt, is not speaking of a literal Babylon that is over in Iraq. Okay? So, and there's, and there's more, more ways to figure this out than one. So, we'll get into that in just a moment here. Slay all her bullocks, let them go down to the slaughter. Woe unto them, for their day has come, the time of their visitation. Hark, they flee and escape out of the land of Babylon to declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of His temple. Now that really caught my attention right there. Flee and escape out of the land of Babylon. Remember Revelation 18, 4, Come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her, of her sins. My people. Is it not Israel that has made the covenant with the Vatican? Is it not even, think about this so now, guys. How many of you guys maybe are, are Baptists or Methodists or Presbyterians or, or, or whatever you may be in different churches? Look at the different churches that have made the covenants with the Vatican to come back to the mother church. So as he says, come out of her, my people. But here's what's important. To declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God. Now see, he tells, he says, flee and escape out of the land of Babylon. To, de excuse me, to declare in Zion, which is Israel, the vengeance of the Lord our God. 
So it's going to be declared to Israel that there is a vengeance against Babylon. Hmm. The vengeance of his temple. All right, now guys, here's one of your biggest clues right here that this has nothing to do with modern or, or ancient Babylon. Why? Why do we know this? God has got a bone to pick. He's got an axe to grind, as we say in the South. He's got a grudge. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And why? It's a 2,000-year-old uh, score that God has got to settle, and he's not forgotten about it. Uh, let me read to you why from Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall an anointed one be cut off. Now that was Yeshua that was cut off in the midst of the last week. That's why it says three score and, um, excuse me, uh, three score and two weeks. That's three and a half years. And that actually did happen according to the ancient Jewish calendar, 360 days in a year, not the Gregorian calendar of 365 days in a year. And by the way, just for a quick thought there, I had a brother write me or a sister, I don't know which at the time, I don't remember now, asked me about worshiping on the Sabbath and Saturday or Sunday and how do we really know if we're going by Gregorian calendar? Well, how do we really know what day of the week it really is anyway? Uh, I know there's people that claim they've done research and they figured all this out, but could we really, can we trust that? You know? The thing is, let's just worship God on what we believe to be the Sabbath now. He'll honor that if we honor Him. But He definitely is not going to honor the Sunday thing, by no means. Anyhow, let me get back to this so we don't lose track. Um, so after three score and two weeks shall, the anoint, shall an anointed one be cut off and, and be no more. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Hmm. But his end shall be with a flood, and to the end of the war desolations are determined. That's according to Daniel 9, 26. And we're reading here in Jeremiah that God is talking about bringing an end to this Babylon, and he says it's what? It's, it's uh, uh, and declare in Zion the vengeance of the Lord our God, the vengeance of his temple. He wants Israel to know God is burning the Vatican for what they did to the temple 2,000 years before that. Who destroyed the temple? Titus, the Roman general. Now, that's called Babylon. Notice what he says here. All right? And the people of a prince that shall come. There's going to be, it's a future prince. Now, he's not an anointed prince. But a prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who's going to destroy the city and the sanctuary? Not the prince that shall come. The, the people that he is of, which was the Romans. See? And until the end of the war, desolations are determined. The desolations are going to be upon the Roman city that destroyed the Vatican. I mean, excuse me, that destroyed the, the temple, God's temple. Now, let's continue on. Call together the archers against Babylon, all them that bend the bow and camp against her round about. Let none thereof escape. Recompense her. According to her work, according to all that she hath done, do unto her, for she hath been arrogant against the Lord, against the Holy One of Israel. That's against Yeshua. Isn't that amazing? She's arrogant against him. Now, think of this here from Revelation chapter 18, verse 6. Reward her even as she rewarded you. Mm. And double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. Isn't it interesting how it just kind of dovetails in with the scriptures here in Jeremiah? Now, notice what, see, John's writing this to the Jewish people. He is Jewish. And it says, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works. You know, the Catholic Church has consented, the popes consented, like Pope Pius XII, consented to the death with Hitler of 
million, six million Jews, and that's just the rough estimate during the Holocaust. What about the Inquisition? What a, the Inquisition really is where a lot of Jews were killed, forced to convert to Catholicism, tortured to prove their conversions, uh, you know, burn at the stake. The true believers, the true Jewish believers that believed Yeshua to be Mashiach, oh my gosh, they were hunted down. They were murdered and killed. The true Christians, the Gentile converts, 66 million of them were murdered. So you see why God says reward her even as she rewarded you. Now let's go to verse 30 in Jeremiah chapter 50. Therefore shall her young men fall in her broad places and all her men of war shall be brought to silence in that day. Behold, I am against thee, O thou most arrogant, saith the Lord uh, uh, God of hosts, for thy day is come and the time that I will punish thee. And the most arrogant shall stumble and fall, and none shall raise him up. I will kindle a fire in his cities, and it shall devour all that are round about, around about him. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel and the children of Judah are oppressed together. All that took them captives hold them fast. They refuse to let them go. And see, that, that's so true. So many refused to let the Jews go home. Uh, the governments refused to let the house of Israel go home. Um, and that's the government of Israel today. So see, God is not pleased. That's, you know, when I get these different comments that come from the people that say that the Rothschilds built Israel, uh, that there is an evil agenda going on, that there is a true evil agenda behind the scenes that is going on. I do believe that. I do believe also there is an agenda to get certain people into Israel that are not really Jewish, that are claiming to be Jews, because why? The Vatican wants to overthrow Israel to get full control. But what happened in the process of doing this, the true religious Jews that made it into Israel finally worked their way up into the government and into powers there, and they've been able to keep it balanced off there. So you do have this evil, sinister group behind the scenes like Shimon Perez uh, and others like him that, that you can easily see in the Knesset. All you have to do is watch the Knesset to see which parliament members, which cabinet ministers are for this peace process or, you know, like, like Miss Lavini, you know, she's for the peace process. Well, who really is she then? You know, it just makes me wonder. And, and I wonder about the organizations that work to do the Aliyah, that there may be an agenda to bring in people that are really not Jewish people. So, and all along, the house of Israel is being snuffed out because they come up with this law uh, saying that you're only Jewish through your mother. Well, you know, I can agree that you should be Jewish through your mother as well, but you can't take the Word of God, and this goes good for you rabbis that have been... Uh, <laughs> arrogant enough to try to change the Word of God. The Word of God clearly shows that you're Jewish by your father as well. If not, you tell me how you're going to have any Levites. Where are we going to get the priesthood then? Where are we going to get the Kohanim and the Levitical, the, the Levites to be able to carry out the Word of God? You're Jewish because of your father, not because of your mother. Okay, but it is an equality there because even Yeshua showed about the Samaritan woman. She was Jewish, not because of her father, but because of her mother. So see, God honors that. And there was nothing wrong to add the part of the mother, but don't take away the part of the father and then pervert the word of God. You have no right, no right, any rabbinical person that brought some rabbinate rule in there to, to, to disallow the word of God, shame on you for doing so. Because God will hold you responsible for that. And it's one reason why the house of Israel is still outside the country. Okay, let's move on. Verse 34. Their Redeemer is strong. The Lord of hosts is His name. He will thoroughly plead their cause that He may give rest to the earth. Now that's kind of interesting. God is going to keep His promise. Just like God keeps His Sabbath, God keeps the... Uh, um, you know, he keeps the Sabbath in the natural. God keeps the Sabbath in the spiritual. God rests on the seventh day. God created the earth so many days, and now we've been on it so many days. God is going to keep the Sabbath for the earth, for the earth to rest too. 
That's why we don't know really what time it is, what day it is. You know, we think that it's the year 2000. We think that it's been 6,000 years the earth has been here thus far. Man's been on it. Undoubtedly, it's not because God says right here, he, uh, he may, that he may give rest to the earth. See? Okay. And disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. In fact, that kind of lets you know that when he gets done dealing with Babylon, that's when the earth will have its rest. So it happens in Daniel's 70th week. Interesting, isn't it? Okay, a sword is upon the Chaldeans, saith the Lord, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, upon her princes, and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the boasters, and they shall become fools. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. A sword is upon their horses. By the way, her mighty men? You have no idea. You know, the Vatican runs the United Nations. The United States military is ran by the Vatican. They set up princes and kings anywhere. Whoever they want to put over this province, that province, all done by the Vatican. You might think I'm trying to pontificate the scriptures. All you have to do is do a little bit more research and you'll find out these things. A sword is upon their horses and upon their chariots and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her. And they shall become as women. A sword is upon her treasures and they shall be robbed. Now, it's interesting that he likens her to women. Wonder why. According to Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great... Remember, she's a mystery Babylon, not. That's why what you're seeing happen in Iraq, there's no doubt there's some kind of significance biblically that's being fulfilled here, but it has nothing to do with the rise of, of Babylon and that there's some Mahdi going to rise up out of this. Now, don't think for a minute, though, that the Pope may not orchestrate something to make it look as if that's going to happen. Why? He needs a distraction off of him. Too many people are really busting him right now. And they need a distraction. And, you, and the sad thing is, so many ministers are falling for it. Well, a lot of ministers are not really falling for it. They're taught to do it. They have to say what the church says. If they don't, they'll lose their millions. I was very proud of Jack Van Ampey the other day to actually call out the Pope the way he did. God bless him. Finally, Jack is starting to stand up like he should and recognize what the problems are going on there. Anyway, she is Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots hmm. and abominations of the earth. All right, so it says they shall become as women. And of course, Revelation says she's the mother of harlots. And it is women, plural. The harlots are her daughters, the denominational systems that are coming back to the mother church now. Verse 38 uh, in, in Jeremiah chapter 50, A drought is upon her waters, and, sh and they shall be dried up. For it is a land of graven images, and they are mad upon things of horror. See, I don't know of any church at all that has more images, more idolatry that has ever been done than the Vatican itself. And they have all their high places all over the world. I need to take, and take you down to a place here in Florida and film there for you. You would be shocked to know what we have in Naples, Florida. I'll take you there so you can see it for yourself. But anyway, uh, also it says they are mad upon things of horror. Well, the thing is, we do have history now. We're able to see that the Vatican was behind all the murderous things. You look at the book called the Fox's Book of uh, uh, um, the Fox's Book of Martyrs. It takes you through what the Vatican did in history through the Middle Ages. But the thing is, what we don't realize right now, a lot of the, the atrocities that are happening even now in the world are perpetrated by the Vatican. Let's move on. Therefore, the wild cats, the jackals shall dwell there, and the ostriches shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. As when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall 
no man, uh, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Now why does he say the son of man? Because the Vatican believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of man. So they claim that they believe him. It's another identifying mark of who this Babylon is. Now, the ancient Babylon, or the Iraqis of today, they don't believe that Jesus is the Son of Man. So, an identifying marker of this mystery Babylon, if you would. So, we go on now. So, it says here in verse 40, As when God overthrew... So okay, we just read that. Uh, behold, verse 41, a people cometh from the north, a great nation, and many kings shall be aroused from the utter parts of the earth. This is Russia, brother, sister. This has nothing to do with other nations. Russia does have a bone to pick with the Vatican. Why? Because when Ronald Reagan was president and John Paul II was the Catholic uh, Pope at that time, they formed what they called the Holy Alliance. And it was to bring down the Soviet Union. And they were very successful in their campaign. Because jo John Paul II wanted to see Poland freed from the grasp of the, of the, of the, uh, the Russians. And so they formed this, what they called a Holy Alliance, to do just that. Church and state were united. And by the way, if you don't believe church and state are united, well... President George Bush made sure that church and state were united during his, his own presidency. And I'm talking about junior there, not senior. And, uh, and he even said that we, could, that we should learn from the moral ethics of the Catholic Church. Interesting for a man that's not Catholic to make such a statement. Verse 42, they lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no compassion. Their voice is like the roaring sea, and they ride upon horses set in array, a man for war against the O daughter of Babylon. Now, the daughter of Babylon, as I told you the other day, just like in Micah chapter 4, the daughter of Zion, both represent a future generation. The daughter of Zion represents Israel today, and the daughter of Babylon represents mystery Babylon written of Revelation that we see now. So we move on to chapter 40, excuse me, uh, verse 43. The king of Babylon hath heard the fame of them, and his hands wax feeble, and anguish hath taken hold of him, in pain as a woman in travail. You see, the Vatican has also been pushing again at, at, at Russia over the Ukrainian crisis. Why do you think, why do you think that Obama has been so bold in pushing at Russia? But Russia is not afraid. Russia is that bear. He is the king of the north. You're not going to push him any longer than what God allows. And then when God lets that bear loose, he is coming in just like the two she-bears that came in and ravaged the 42 children in Israel. They're going to come in and they're going to just totally ravage and destroy the Vatican. It actually will take place at the death of the two witnesses. Because the Bible says that they, the earth will rejoice at that time when the two witnesses are dead. And God swore that he would destroy this mystery Babylon at the time when the world rejoices. So at that particular time when the two witnesses are killed and their bodies lay in the street dead, God will bring his vengeance upon for, the, for, the, for his temple's sake and for the, for the sake of his two witnesses that are there at that scene there. Let's go on to verse 44. Behold, he shall come up like a lion from the thickets of the Jordan, of the Jordan against the strong habitation. For I will suddenly make them run away from it, and whoso has chosen him will I appoint over it. For who is like me? And who will appoint me a time? And who is that shepherd that will stand before me? Isn't it interesting how God points out? See, why? The Vatican, they say that the Pope is a vicar of Christ. He's like the Most High God. It didn't Satan say he would sit in the temple of God and be worshipped as if he were God, exalting himself above all that is called God? Hello. The Pope is the vicar of Christ in the place of Christ. The Antichrist word, Antichrist, is a Greek word which means Antichristo. Remember, Antichristo is not like our English language. 
In the English language, we say anti-Christ, anti, means against Christ. But that's not what the word implies. In the Greek, the word antichristo literally means in the stead of the Messiah or in place of. It's like a counterfeit. Well, hello, the Pope is that counterfeit and claims to be the vicar or the substitute for Christ. Well, God kind of mocks him right here in verse 44 when he says, And who will appoint me a time? And who is that shepherd? Isn't it funny? Shepherd. What did, what did uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu call him when he actually went and took him the gift of the menorah? Him and his wife and some of his delegation of his staff were come, come to Rome. And when they delivered it, the Prime Minister said, You are the good shepherd of our common heritage. Well, the, the Prime Minister was actually biblically prophesying to you whether he realizes it or not who the shepherd is of chapter 40 excuse me verse 44 of Jeremiah chapter 50 let's move on verse 45 therefore hear ye the counsel of the Lord that he hath taken against Babylon in his purpose that he hath purposed against the land of the Chaldeans surely the least of the flock shall drag them away surely their habitation shall be appalled at them verse 46 at the noise of the taking of, of Babylon the earth quaketh and the cry is heard among the nations now I shared with you the other day when I talked to you about this here the Hebrew translations of these particular key words here and Clearly, you know, let me just go here. Mikol, from, from, from the voice, Nitapashach, uh, Bevel, or Babylon, Nirasha, Haaretz, Uzaka, Begoim, Nishma. Now, what is this? This is not just, it's not an earthquake like that there. But it is, it, it, it is an upheaval. The people are, they're, they're all upset because of what's happening to the Vatican. They're, they're freaking out. Oh my God, what's happening? Why is Russia coming in to destroy this, this, this great place? See, and there's an outcry. What is that outcry for? They're like, you got, you're kidding me. This is, what is happening to the world? What's going on? Why? See, Remember the, the scripture says over in Revelation um, that they stood afar off and said, how could this happen? This great city, in one hour, she comes to naught. She comes to nothing. And they're weeping and wailing over this. Now, if we go into chapter 51, it says here, Thus saith the Lord, Ka'oma, We'll say Adonai. I don't want to say his divine name until he's revealed it. According to Zephaniah, he will reveal it soon. Behold, I will raise up against Babylon and against them that dwell in Le, uh, Leb Kami, a destroying wind. See? A ruach uh, mashachit, a destroying wind. And I will send into Babylon strangers that shall fan her, and they shall empty her land, and for in the day of trouble they shall be against her roundabout. I've wondered who those strangers were. I've got different thoughts on it, but I've never really come to a conclusion yet who they really are. Let the archer bend his bow against her and let him lift himself up against her in his coat of mail and spare ye not her young men. Destroy ye utterly all her host. It's pretty much World War III is what it looks like to me. And they shall fall down slain in the land of the Chaldeans and thrust through in her streets. Isn't it interesting that they're going to be thrust through? You have to understand, God is doing vengeance. He was thrust through on Calvary. And so he is bringing his vengeance upon them, what they did to him. Verse 5, we're in chapter 51 of Jeremiah, by the way. Verse 5, for Israel is not widowed nor Judah of his God, uh, of the Lord of hosts, for their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Now, my brother, sister, this is a very powerful passage.
passage right here. This really clinches who Mystery Babylon really is. Let's read it again. For Israel is not widowed, nor Judah of his God, of the Lord of hosts, for their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Hmm. Let me read to you something here found in the book of Ezekiel. Maybe this will clear this up for you. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy cities shall not return. And you shall know that I am the Lord, because thou hast said, These two nations and these two countries shall be mine, and we will possess it. Whereas the Lord was there. We're in Ezekiel chapter 35, by the way, verses 9 through 11. And we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. Where was the Lord at? The Lord came to Israel. You know, this word Lord here is God's divine name, the yod He vav He. When the Lord came to Zion, it was Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth. But clearly, Ezekiel says the Lord was there. God recognized that when Yeshua came to Israel, that it was God himself in that human body that was walking here. The Son of God was in tabernacling God himself. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will do according to thine anger and according to thy envy, which thou hast used out of thy hatred against them, and I will make myself known among them when I shall judge thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord have heard all thy blasphemies, which thou hast spoken against the mountains of Israel, saying, They are laid desolate. They are given us to devour. That's why God says here, for Israel is not widowed, nor Judah of his God. You say the land is desolate as if God is dead? Do you not know that also in Ezekiel 36, when God sits there and he swears he would, do, he would bring Israel back to their homeland, not for their sake, but he said for my name's sake. So when you say that the land of Israel is desolate, when we take and we claim that God is not, you know, it's like saying God is dead. When you say, when you believe in replacement theology like the Jehovah's Witness people do, you claim God is dead. That God, that, that Israel is widowed, her husband is dead. Well, most of them just try to say she's divorced. But God says, for Israel is not widowed. God is letting us know, you claim that she's dead, that God is dead. He also says, for their land is full of guilt against the Holy One of Israel. Hmm. Sure it is. That's why he has to come and forgive them of their own iniquities. Let's go a little further. Verse 6, flee out of the midst of Babylon and save every man his life. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for it is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Okay, flee out of the midst of Babylon and save every man his life. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for it is a time of the Lord's vengeance. Her iniquity? I mean, come on, brother, sister, what, what does this have to do with modern-day Babylon? Why does every man have to flee out of there? Now, watch carefully. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, save every man his life. Every man. Every denomination, every walk of life. Whether you go to the Catholic Church or not, if your church has joined in with this system, you're in there. You're part of it. This is how that mark of the beast will come in. You can't buy or sell saving you take the mark. It's going to have something to do with the Vatican controlling the world economics. And so, yeah, you can still be Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, whatever you want to be. Sure you can. As long as your system doesn't speak against the Vatican. And believe me, they are, they are really... 
gaining a lot of momentum in that area. That's why all these preachers are standing up and saying how great it is. That's why Kenneth Copeland just goes, sucks right up to the Pope and all those different groups that, are, that were there with him. I'll tell you what, if there's somebody that was in Kenneth Copeland's campaign that is an evangelical Christian, that is a pastor or a minister of a church, to sit there and recognize that this was of the devil, I wish you would take and write me a letter and let me know that. You know, otherwise, I just lumped you in the same lump with the rest of them. Just like with uh, recently, he had uh, Joel Osteen over to, to the Vatican. And he had Joel pray for him. Well, you know, no wonder why, you know, Joel's the prosperity minister. So, you know, you want to make sure he gets another uh, $20 trillion or something. Who knows, who, who knows what the, all this nonsense is about? But anyway, so let's get back to the main point. Be not cut off in her iniquity, for it is a time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Now, Revelation 18.4. There again, scripture that matches what's being said here. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. All right. Let's read verse 7 of Jeremiah chapter 51. Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand. That's odd, isn't it? That made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. Let's see what it says in Revelation chapter 18 verse 9. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. My brother, sister, do you think that modern day Babylon is going to suddenly make the whole world rich? With what? Where is the wealth of the world right now? And don't try the idea that Iraq, well, Iraq's got all this oil. Russia's got a lot more oil than Iraq ever thought about having. And now Israel's got a nice little gold mine of oil of its own, which Russia's planning on taking that. Russia's got plenty of natural gas. You know, you got, you got Iran and all these other countries, Saudi Arabia. Iraq is just one little drop in the bucket when it comes to the oil. So don't think that, the, that just because they got oil, that doesn't make the world rich. It makes the oil companies rich, but not, you know, not, not anybody else. This has got to be an entity that makes the entire world wealthy because the Bible clearly says right here in Revelation 18, excuse me, not Revelation, Revelation yeah, 18, verse 9, and the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and live deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, Revelation 18, 9. Now, it's not over yet. Watch what else happens. In verse 8 of Jeremiah 51, Babylon is suddenly fallen and destroyed. Well for her, take balm for her pain. If so, be she may be healed. Hmm. According to Revelation 14, 8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, the great city, because she hath made all nations drink of what? The wine of the wrath of her fornication. That does not match up here with verse 7. Same thing. See? The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. All the nations, every nation goes to the Vatican. Now, they, all the nations don't go to Babylon. That's why it's called Mystery Babylon. That's why she's called the daughter of Babylon. See, what, what Nebuchadnezzar had when he was king of Babylon, and of course Cyrus and Darius and all these other guys, which by the way, if you think about it, look at, look at the history of, of Babylon to begin with, how they were for the building of the temple, the second temple, how that they actually give a decree, Darius gives a decree to go back and build the temple. It's put in the writings. You know, same thing the Vatican's doing right now. We haven't seen the Vatican come out and say build the third temple as of yet. But, you know, the Vatican does want to take and annihilate the Jews, that's for sure. At least in this case here, the kings of Persia, when they woke up, Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes, they actually were for the Jews. As we have not learned anything, have we, my Jewish brethren? Okay, 
verse 9 in uh, Jeremiah chapter 51, We would have healed Babylon, but she has not healed. Forsake her, and let us go, every one, into his own country, for her judgment reacheth into heaven, and she is lifted up even to the skies. The Lord hath brought forth our victory. Come and let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord of our God. Make bright the arrows. Fill the quivers. The Lord hath roused the spirit of the kings of Medes because his device is against Babylon to destroy it. For it is vengeance, um, for it is the vengeance of the Lord, the vengeance of his temple. Again, a 2,000 year old vengeance that God has for what Rome did when Titus, a Roman general, came in there, destroyed the second temple. And this is what's interesting. That's why we see that Rome, you don't think that the Roman Catholic Church and, and the leaders of Rome, uh, Constantinople and all those guys don't have the same thing in common. Well, let me tell you something. It's pretty obvious what God's intending on doing. It shows that it does have something to do with it because God is taking vengeance on them 2,000 years after the fact. So the political Rome back then and or the military Rome back then and the papal Rome today God is lumping in the same boat and he's going to bring his vengeance out on them in this day. Okay. And he even offered them to be healed, but they won't. Why? You know, see, they claim him to be their Messiah, but instead they, they, they built up the greatest uh, idolizing uh, demonic place in all the world to ever see. There's idols in every high place you can imagine and all over the world as well. Verse 12, set up a standard against the walls of Babylon, make the watch strong, set the watchman, prepare the ambush, for the Lord hath both devised and done that which he spoke concerning the inhabitants of Babylon. O thou that dwellest upon many waters, abundance and treasures, thine end is come, the measure of thy covetousness. And they are certainly a covetous church. Uh, read Revelation 17, 1. And there came out of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked to me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. See, the waters is, represents in the Bible peoples, multitudes of peoples. And the Vatican is in every nation on the earth. They're, they're everywhere. And scripture right here, Jeremiah says, uh, that she is upon many waters. You know, it's funny, when you read Jeremiah and you read Revelation chapter 18, it's almost like you're reading the same, or anywhere from 14 on down to 18. It's like you're reading the same story. The Lord of hosts has sworn by himself, verse 14, Surely I will fill thee with men, and uh, as with the canker worm, they shall lift up a shout against thee. And that's actually where I ended it right there. A shout against thee. So it is coming to an end is what's going to happen. But I wanted to bring this out for you to see some of the scriptures that match this because I don't want you to be in a delusion to think that what's happening with ISIS, that ISIS is actually going to uh, reestablish a Babylonian kingdom and that there's going to be an Antichrist come out of there. Uh, don't think, though, that I don't think that the Vatican may not have purposed this in order to keep attention away from them. you got to remember, the Vatican is using a lot of people to preach that particular message. There's a lot of men out there, and I'm not going to bust their chops right now, but there's a lot of ministers out there, very famous ministers, that are preaching a Muslim Antichrist, the Mahdi. And so the Vatican has got to fabricate something, and believe me, they will do a lot of bloodshed to make that happen to make it look like it's something else altogether in order to try to make it look like it's going to fit the Word. But see, Satan can't make the Word fit. That's his problem. But by God's grace, we're sharing to you what does fit, how the Bible works properly. And let me just share this with you as I close now. Because the stand I take, and because I'm not here to tickle your ears or to make you feel good. I don't, I don't mean that in a bad way either because I do love you guys. You know, there's many people that have supported this ministry in the past that have left as a result of that. But I've always told my wife, it's important that we tell people the truth. We're not here to tickle people's ears. We're here 
to be as honest with you as we possibly can because on the day of judgment we have to answer for that. We're not here for sensationalism. You know, not to say that I'm not going to try to word a title sometimes that might catch people's attention, but the purpose is to get the people to come and hear something that's true. You know, and if and if the only way people would support this ministry is for me to just make everybody feel good, then I might as well stop. You know, and I've told my wife, we're not doing that. It's important that we stay true to God, true to His Word. God will take care of everything else. And so that's what we're going to do for you. We're, by His grace, I keep trying more and more to, to update you about things that are happening in the world, but to bring you the Word of God, especially in light of the events that are taking place in the world. Because I'm seeing all kinds of sensationalism. And maybe that's what brings other people's support because they're so sensational. You know, well, I'm not going to go that route. I want to make sure that you know exactly where we're standing. You know, there is coming a time where there's going to be a mark of the beast. I know a lot of people they'll write me, you know, Brother Steve, I believe that you, I thought you were a pre-trib rapture person. I don't, I don't know if we're in tribulation or not. I really don't. You know? But I'm for whenever he wants to come. I'm not mid-trib, pre-trib, or post-trib. Now I do believe post-trib is just absolutely ridiculous. I really do. That doesn't even make sense. What, what's he got to, what has he got to rapture out to come the end of everything? Well, that doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't even go right with the word of God. But the thing is, is I don't know when he's coming, but I do know this. We need to be ready and we need to be aware of what's happening. Because what if he doesn't come pre-trib? What if he comes six months into the seven year uh, covenant that's done with Israel? What if it's two years? What if it's two days? And, you know, I have a feeling he's going to end up doing something like that. He's not going to come pre, or if he does do pre, maybe like Chuck Missler says, maybe it'll be six months before the signing of this covenant. But it's going to come at a time when we don't, we think it not, as the Bible says. thing is, we want to be ready no matter what. We want to pray for our loved ones, and that's one thing, though, I am guilty of. I'm going to make you stay on the edge of your seat to see what the hour is, because we have loved ones, I do as well as you do, that need to be saved, that need to know Yeshua as their Messiah. And I want to get, I want you to be ready. I want you to be in love with Yeshua. I want you to, to have a relationship with Him beyond anything else. In fact, when we do Shabbat, uh, our live Shabbat service this Saturday at 11 a.m., by the way, for those of you that do not know, 11 a.m. Saturday on, on live stream. We'll be live. You can, you can join us there. We're going to talk about keeping the Sabbath. It's a commandment of God. You know, but there's so many things we're going to get into that I'm hoping will be a blessing to you guys. I won't keep you any longer. I love you guys. By the way, the background you're seeing here, uh, this is actually part of the setup. We set up this little area. It's actually in my office. It looks like a bedroom. But uh, in the documentary, we have actually started the documentary. Um, that I, don't, I can't say when it's going to be available. I don't know, guys, but we are filming it already. This is the setup for that particular uh, film that will be to help you to help Jewish people recognize the Messiah. Uh, I think it's an excellent tool even for the agnostic. It'll be an excellent tool for uh, Christian believers that you, or Christian people or are just people that are lukewarm, that need to be on fire for God. Because we're really going in, into the Word of God and, and this documentary lays out who the Messiah is. And it is going to be free of charge uh, because I, by the, the laws, if I want to be able to use copyrighted material, so long as I don't do it for profit, we're able to do that and use, this, use the information by law uh, and I think it's really important that we include some of this footage in from the different films that have been done because it'll give an impact for when people watch it to, to understand better what we're trying to, to show there. But, uh, but anyway, pray for us because we are in the process of filming that now. Um, and so I won't make any promises when it'll be done. But uh, 
Just pray for us that God will lead and direct everything that we do. Pray for those three boys in Israel that got kidnapped. That has, I have not been burdened for something so much in my life as I have been for these boys here. So pray for me, pray for them, and God bless you until we get to speak again. Shalom.